Hey everybody, it's Shu here, back with another Let's Play Community College, where we play games and hopefully come out a little smarter than when we started. Today we're playing Papers, Please, and talking about what to do when you get stopped by the police. Papers, Please is a Kafka-esque high-speed bureaucracy simulator, where you deny entry to refugees, take bribes, break up families, and feel the weight of poverty and totalitarianism pressure you into violating the common dignity of your fellow man. Today we'll be playing on Endless Mode. Now, speaking of violating the common dignity of your fellow man, what do you do when stopped by the police? It's an important topic, and yet one people are badly informed about. I used to give a talk on this as part of my work with a state chapter of the ACLU, and what I found talking with people was that the amount of misinformation and bad advice out there is not just discouraging, it's actively dangerous. And not just dangerous in the sense that you can be physically harmed. That's a very real danger, but it's not the full picture. Even if nobody touches you, it can be dangerous to consent to an otherwise illegal search of your car, your home, or your personal effects. You don't know if your belongings will be treated carefully, you don't know if other people around you, including the police, can be trusted not to escalate the situation, and you may not know what can be seized and used to justify an arrest. None of this is to diminish how terrible police violence can be, rather my point is that you need to have a full sense of the danger of the situation. It's more than just violence. Officer Friendly might not beat you down, but can you afford to get arrested over some weed? Weed that he wouldn't have even found if you hadn't consented to an otherwise illegal search? That's why it's important to know your rights and how to exercise them safely and responsibly. Unfortunately, this talk can only focus on encounters with the police in the United States. Toward the end, we'll talk about the limitations of knowing and exercising these rights as well. I want to start by dispelling some of the big myths around this topic. The first is that old canard that if asked directly, a cop can't lie to you about being a cop. Some people will swear up and down that this is true. Most of them are in jail. Another myth is that police have to read you your rights in all circumstances, and that failing to do so would nullify an arrest. Your Miranda rights are a product of the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. In particular, its clause against self-incrimination. As such, police only have to advise you of your rights when, one, you have been arrested, and two, you are being questioned. Don't go volunteering information. And finally, before we get going, I want to offer a disclaimer. Rights aren't real. Remember that as we talk. We'll return to it at the end. Rights are not real. Rather than go into Fourth Amendment case law, I'm going to give you the shortest and simplest version of your rights when stopped by police and follow up on that at the end. The Fourth Amendment protects you from unreasonable search and seizure, and so that's the basis of most of your encounters with the police. When stopped by the police, you have the right to remain silent, as we've established. You should verbally express this if you choose to do so. Say, I am choosing to remain silent. Police can demand your driver's license, vehicle registration, and proof of insurance if you're driving, but you don't have to answer other questions. Some states have laws where police can demand identification, but only on reasonable suspicion that you've committed a crime. If asked questions or asked to provide ID in these situations, ask if you're being detained or free to go. If you are free to go, leave. You can refuse to consent of a search of your body, your car, or your home, but there are exceptions. Searches with a valid warrant are legal. Frisks are legal when an officer has a reasonable suspicion that you're armed and dangerous. Don't lie to the police and don't give them false documents, even if you're an undocumented immigrant. Fake papers are worse than none. The most intrusive searches and seizures are only reasonable when backed by a warrant, but most police conduct, an ordinary frisk or search of a car, the things we're dealing with here, don't need a warrant. Without a warrant, police are still allowed comparatively minor searches. Things in plain view or on your body or in your home or car that can be seen can be seized without even needing a search. That includes smells that a dog can pick up. Police are allowed to pat you down if they have a reasonable suspicion that you're armed and dangerous. You can also be stopped if police have a reasonable suspicion you're involved in a crime. These stops, called Terry stops, after the Supreme Court case of Terry v. Ohio, make up a large part of police contact with the rest of us. Now let's cut the formality for a second. The deck is stacked against you here. Reasonable suspicion is a joke. It's frequently manufactured after the fact. In a he said, she said scenario, your story probably isn't winning over the cops. So not only is demanding that a cop tell you what his reasonable suspicion is not going to save you from a search, circumstances would have to be pretty damn dire to challenge that suspicion in court. The sad reality of it is, then, police can easily perform a Terry stop or Terry frisk whenever they want. If you grew up in a poor neighborhood and or one with a large population of people of color, you're probably familiar with this sad fact. A 2006 report to the U.S. Department of Justice found that police determined suspicion by factors including wearing all-black clothing, 
looking like someone doesn't belong, not matching a neighborhood's predominant racial makeup, the officer's own personal judgment as to whether a person is lying or being nervous around police. A Denver Police Department list of suspicious activity includes attempts to appear, quote, normal, such as portraying oneself as a student or tourist. George Mason University law professor Craig Lerner said in the school's working paper series, quote, This dichotomy between facts and intuitions is built on sand. He complains that, quote, The legal system in practice simply rewards those officers who are able and willing to spin their behavior in a way that satisfies judges, while it penalizes those officers who are less verbally facile or who are transparent about their motivations. It would be preferable if politically accountable authorities joined the courts in monitoring police practices. The focus should be less on what police say after the fact and more on what they do. End quote. Police violence is real. Abuse of power is real. Rights are imaginary. Rights are one of two things. They can be normative statements that reflect our values. If I say, quote, healthcare is a basic human right, I mean, I believe everyone should have healthcare. Or, rights can be freedoms with power backing them up. Things the government will refuse to prosecute, or things that people will protect with force. When we talk about rights here, we're going to be talking about them in the second context. If I say, you don't have any rights, I'm not saying, I don't think you deserve rights and freedoms. I'm saying, there is no structure or power in place that is willing and able to defend those freedoms. Rights aren't magical. Knowing your rights, properly asserting them, and hoping the police respect them are very different things. That's because the Fourth Amendment only protects you after the fact. It can be used to exclude illegally obtained evidence. It can be the basis of a civil rights claim if you sue for damages after an illegal search, but only if there are monetary damages or you can prove the police acted with malice. Good luck with that. But it has no tools to address the majority of violations of people's actual Fourth Amendment rights. The illegal search without provable damages, the racist police profiling backed up with flimsy pretext, and so on. And if the Fourth Amendment has no power to protect these rights, those rights aren't worth a paper they're printed on. The reality of it is that knowing and invoking your rights won't stop police abuse. Not only will it not stop illegal searches, but plenty of abusive searches are, strictly speaking, legal. During his term as mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg oversaw a policy of widespread stop and frisks, and a New York district court was only able to determine that the practice was illegal when confronted with overwhelming evidence that it disproportionately targeted African Americans and Latinos. You'd never be able to establish these stops as individually illegal. And it's these kinds of searches that make a large amount of day-to-day -day police abuse. When it comes down to it, knowing your rights is good for two things. One, knowing that you're free to leave if you're not being detained. And two, challenging the admissibility of evidence in court. That's a pretty narrow context and touches on only a small corner of what day-to-day -day police abuse really is. Legality is a construct of the powerful. It doesn't exist to protect you, and in most of these cases, it fucking fails to. When you know this, when you really understand how little your rights can meaningfully protect you, it should inform how you interact with the police. The most important lesson? Play it safe. Do what it takes to get out of police presence as quickly as you safely and legally can. Use your own judgment about the degree to which invoking and sticking to your rights will actually protect you. If you're free to go, by all means, leave. But be aware of the reality of how little your rights can protect you. I'll leave you with two examples. Search YouTube for the phrase, I know my rights, and you'll find videos by comedic character Steve Jessup, in which he's pulled over for driving down the road drunk on tractors, lawnmowers, scissor lifts, and so on. His character is an over-the-top parody of the kind of boisterous, active citizenship we like to think comes with being an American. He vocally defends his rights, despite clearly being in the wrong. Compare that to the story of Sandra Bland, a 28-year-old African-American woman who knew her rights and invoked them during a police stop in July this year. Ms. Bland knew her rights and stood by them. She refused to comply with police officer Brian Encinia's illegal demands. For her trouble, she was threatened with a taser, thrown to the ground, arrested and jailed without any valid charges, and was by all appearances murdered while in police custody. I don't mean to diminish the gravity of what happened by pairing it with video games, but I can't talk to you about how to know and protect your rights and just pump sunshine up your ass and repeat your high school civics class on the importance of vigorous active citizenship. The Constitution didn't protect Sandra Bland, and now she's dead. That's the reality on the ground. Use your own best judgment and please stay safe. Thanks for watching.